be happy to tell you, um, uh, you know, obviously a little bit about uh, our program um, and our process. And obviously, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions about uh, what we're doing um, a, with the upcoming admission cycle, uh, particularly as it relates to all of the challenges that are going on for schools across the country. Um, so I'm happy to answer those questions as well. Um, and uh, first, you know, thank thank you uh, for uh, giving us this time uh, to kind of talk a little bit about the program. Um, I'm Donald Pritchett. I'm the Assistant Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs uh, at NSUMD. I've uh, been here for three years now, and before that, I was uh, uh, at Albany Medical College for a number of years. Um, so I've been doing this for a minute now, well over a decade. Um, in terms of medical school admissions. Um, along with me on the call is Ms. Jamie Reed, uh, who's my admissions coordinator. She kind of handles uh, everything uh, in the admissions office, uh, particularly the uh, process as it relates to um, the admission cycle and application cycle and interview cycle, uh, which is finishing up this week um, before we transition into the next cycle uh, for whatever <laughs> that may look like in the fall. So, um, you know, thank everyone for being here. Um, you know, honestly, I always like to answer, just answer questions. Um, I don't know if kind of uh, the best avenue either you can if, ask. Them. Oh, go ahead. Jamie. I was going to say, if anybody wants to put questions in the chat, um, I can keep an eye on the chat for you while you're um, answering questions and going over stuff. Perfect. Yeah, because I don't generally <laughs> look at the chat, uh, as Jamie knows. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what our profile has looked like um, and uh, give you a brief overview of our admissions process, what we look for in committee, and then uh, I'd rather just spend most of the time just answering questions because I know you guys have a lot of questions. So uh, our last two, we are on our third class now. Um, we are um, relatively new, no longer in the charter year, uh, but we are relatively uh, new and moving into our third cycle now. We're completing our third admissions cycle now. Um, our charter class, in fact, was scheduled to begin their first rotations uh, in their clerkships uh, as uh, beginning next week, ironically enough. Um, and of course, that's been put on hold right now until August, um, although they will be doing um, other things uh, taking other electives online throughout the summer, um, which is one of the, the things we've had to do similar to a, a lot of other medical schools in the country, uh, while students are not um, allowed to rotate on site um, at medical facilities. Um, so our charter class is scheduled to do that. The bulk have taken USMLE. Unfortunately, there were less than a handful um, that did not get to take it before their dates were canceled. Um, and uh, so we don't have the full data for me to share, but what I can say is uh, uh, we've been very pleased uh, thus far uh, with the performance on our students on USMLE and uh, hopefully our, our students, when they, the remaining students, when they get the chance, we'll close that out and we can share that data a little bit more. Um, but I hate to share incomplete data, but I can tell you that my heart is smiling as it relates to USMLE uh, performance of our charter class and hopefully our our second class can keep that going and our subsequent classes can keep that going. And as soon as our students, all of our students have taken that, we will, um, we will, um, you know, release that full data. Um, but anyway, we are in our third iteration of this process. Um, in our first year, um, our profile, I usually kind of start with that. Um, we bring in 50 students each year. That's not going to change uh, through accreditation where um, our full accreditation should take place. Oh, it's, um, cannot take place, and this is a required of LCME. Um, it is a, uh, a process, and we are now in the second phase of that. Our second site visit, in, in fact, for the next level of accreditation was supposed to be happening again in May. Um, that has now been pushed to August, but we're confident. We've always been ahead of the game in terms of accreditation, and we're, we're confident we'll continue that. After your first class graduates, and this is true, the accreditation process for any medical school um, is when you receive your full accreditation. And right now we're on track to do that. Um, in fact, we got our first uh, our, uh, preliminary accreditation in record time, um, in fact. So as I said, we've been ahead of the game. Um, unfortunately, we won't keep that record track going, not because of the, uh, us, but because of the COVID-19, which threw our site visit off a little bit. Um, but we're on pace to continue that. We think our students' performance thus far on their assessments and uh, as they move into their clerkships will help us 
uh, get through the next phase, which is provisional. And then after that, once our last class, our first class, I'm sorry, graduates, um, will reach full accreditation status. So that's the timeline we're on for that. Thrown off a little bit, as I said, by the pandemic, but we're looking to get back on track uh, with that in August. Um, the profile for the first class of uh, the MCAT, average MCAT was about a 5.11. Uh, the average GPA uh, was around a 3.68 overall, I believe. Um, and uh, for the second class, uh, those numbers ticked up just a, a tad. Uh, the uh, average is, was around a 5.12. Um, the GPA was around a 3.71. Um, it's likely that the second class will kind of live in that same profile range. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the third class, um, the incoming class for the fall will probably live in that range. So we'll, moving forward through full accreditation, we'll probably be in that 511, 512, uh, 3.7 to 3.75 range um, for, for uh, the immediate future. As I said, we bring in 50 students per year. Um, again, that won't change anytime soon. Uh, at least through accreditation, we're not planning to increase the class size. We, our applicant pool, uh, we have about 3,000 secondary applications. Um, it looks like, again, we're only in our second year, but you begin to normalize usually around the th uh, years three and five. Um, not too much we can make of the first year um, we have, uh, uh, because we didn't have a full application cycle, but our first full application cycle was this year and we had over 3,000 app secondary applications. That'll probably be the same for second year. Uh, I mean, for the next year application as well. Um, so we're anticipating, as I said, our profile will be around that. Uh, our students come from all across the country. Um, we do not have any set limits in terms of how many in-state or out-of-state students we bring in, but generally um, it's almost a 50-50 split in terms of out-of-state residents to in-state residents, um, but we try to diversify the class as much as possible in terms of geographic location. So we interview candidates from all over the country. Um, trying to think, we do have, um, in terms of real quickly, uh, what we, we kind of look for in applicants, uh, obviously we, well, our format, we use a um, team-based learning and the problem-based problem -based learning format is the crux of our curriculum. Um, and uh, without getting into too much detail, it's a small group format. Um, students is case-based uh, assessment learning. Um, so the students work in teams a lot and, and work with cases to learn med medicine and how to assess. There's a lot of patient interaction from day one um, through practice of medicine. Our students are also assigned uh, to a preceptor um, early in their academic careers. So there's a lot of hands-on training. The point is to bridge, not only teach students how to apply medical knowledge to patient assessment, but have them do that hands-on as well. So obviously in our applicants, we look for a lot of um, kind of clinical exposure, a lot of hands-on engagement through their experiences. Um, also, uh, research is also a requirement in our program. Um, you don't have to have extensive, extensive bench or, or um, uh, just solely bench research. We look for a variety of uh, more understanding of research methodology, but research is um, a requirement in our program. So we do kind of look for aspects of that um, in our applicants. Um, of course, solid academic performance, solid performance on the MCAT. Um, and... Uh, uh, and obviously the feedback of your peers, your letters of recommendations and things like that. So the basic components uh, of your application are assessed from bow to stern. We take a holistic approach to the application. Um, so pretty much everything that we ask for in your AMCAS application is important, including our specific questions in the secondary application. Um, that is a sweeping overview but I see that there's kind of questions that are coming in. So I'd rather answer specific questions. Um, All right, you want me to start with the first one? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we have a senior graduating this semester, planning mm -hmm. on taking the MCATs early fall. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend they do during this time of studying to get the application process started? They wanna make sure that they don't miss any deadlines for the next class being reviewed. Um, you know, I, I, at this point, I, there's not too much you can do until you take the MCAT. Um, I would say that if anything, when you go to apply, 
Um, you know, I usually say apply earlier than later. Um, the application process is still scheduled to open in June, although, or a little bit later, I believe, maybe two weeks mm -hmm. later than normal. Um, and we'll receive data a little bit, and this is true of all medical schools, a little bit later from AMCAS. Uh, but generally, it's always good to try and be prepared to apply. Um, I used to say July 1st. Um, taking, the thing about taking um, the MCAT in the fall is that you won't be assessed uh, until you take your MCAT. I mean, you don't have a complete file. Um, so uh, I know they've added test dates, which is great, um, but it still kind of pushes you later into the application cycle. So honestly, if that's kind of the last component, you want to do well, because the later you move in the cycle, um, the more you want your application to be complete and strong in every component. Um, so I'd put, say, now that you have time, <laughs> uh, we're all kind of trapped in the house. I would say, you know, make sure you um, use that time wisely uh, and, and build a study schedule. Um, it's funny uh, for USMLE, which I always say is the most important test you'll ever take uh, as a medical student in your step one exam. We give our students eight weeks of dedicated time. Most studies have shown that if you, and dedicated being the key word, um, it, most studies have shown that if you build a solid study schedule and you commit six to eight weeks to that preparation, um, at anything after six weeks begin, you, you start to get diminishing returns. If you're studying to the, to the extent that you should, you start to get diminishing returns. And at eight weeks, you kind of maxed out. Um, so I normally don't recommend, um, the MCAT is a very important exam. It tests the medical knowledge you have in place, but it, in terms of intensity, it is not comparable to the USMLE. So if you can debt, if through dedicated study, you can perform well through six to eight weeks of dedicated study, you should be able to do the same with the MCAT. So it's really about building a schedule that, that allows for you to give that type of commitment, um, particularly if you have other commitments, if you have to work or do anything like that, um, which brings the work-life balance, uh, makes it even more important. So it's really about building out that schedule. You shouldn't need months to, to study for the MCAT um, if you build a deliberate schedule. Um, so you should, if you know your test date, you should plan accordingly in terms of your test schedule. Uh, outside of that, where possible, um, once you can, we can fully integrate back into, uh, obviously, society uh, at large, you know, try to focus on getting some many meaningful clinical experiences. All right, so next question. Um, Will the admissions committee be expressing leniency towards lower MCAT scores due to the pandemic? Uh, I'd probably say no. I mean, um, as I said, uh, it's the pandemic doesn't change your knowledge base. Um, it doesn't change uh, the nature of what you should be able to, to do when you have the assessment. Um, and uh, so when it, it, if we say leniency in terms of if you're scoring lower, lower uh, if we'll kind of look at that more favorably, no, I, I don't think we'll, we'll, it'll be assessed in the same light at any other time. Um, I think, uh, if anything, will probably be looked at through a, a more lenient, that's an interesting choice of word, but through a more uh, lenient um, lens, I would say maybe experiences. Um, a lot of people have had, uh, were engaged um, in clinical experiences or research projects or uh, volunteer experiences that are now, that have not, now been obviously halted in a lot of regards. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people maybe were leaning on those things to really enhance, kind of be the cherry on top in their application. Um, so I think there'll be more leniency in that regard. Um, it, and as it relates to any type of academic performance, um, I think maybe uh, uh, in terms of grades, particularly in the, the spring semester, you know, I think, um, um, well, a lot of committees will really uh, try to be more open-minded um, in terms of grade assessments uh, because they know a lot of students' um, curriculum just kind of midstream shifted online. So I think they, that will, there'll be a lot more deliberation and consideration. But as it relates to the, the MCAT itself, that exam is standardized and it remains the same. So you should be able to perform the, if you have the requisite knowledge base, you should be a, your performance shouldn't be impacted when you take the exam. 
um, a question from Stephanie. Are there any joint degree options available at NSUMD? For example, MD, MBA. If not, will this be considered in the future? Um, it, uh, the answer is no right now and then yes to in the future. Um, our focus really was just on making sure we did everything um, to get our full accreditation. Um, and, and a large, those problems, you're a, a lot of those type programs. Um, uh, sorry, that was an interesting way to phrase that. Um, many of the joint degree programs kind of derive from um, your, your fully accredited uh, program. Um, so uh, I think first is to put in the foundation, make sure that we get through that process first before we start adding <laughs> kind of programs because those programs also have to be assessed by LCME. Um, but generally, once you have your full accreditation for your um, primary program, that process is a lot smoother. So, yeah, the plans are already in place um, to, to have joint degree, um, both joint degree and um, combined degree programs, kind of bridge programs in place, uh, hopefully even with NSU. Um, but, you know, those probably won't start uh, being put fully in place until after our full accreditation in 2022. Um, is there any favorability shown by admissions, the admissions committee as an NSU undergrad or alumni? Um, nothing uh, formalized in our process. I mean, obviously, like most, I, I think like a lot of institutions, we like to keep our own. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't think uh, there's any tipping point for any candidate, um, you know, based on school or numbers or anything. But you know, I think it would also be disingenuous to say that we, we don't try to keep our own or try to get as many of our own uh, that are qualified in, into the interview process um, and hopefully get them accepted. Uh, in fact, uh, our, the number of students um, from class one to class two that came from an issue increased um, from year one to year two. Um, and internally, we're excited about that. Like I said, we like to, we definitely like to keep our own um, but again, it's not formalized, but, um, you know, I think it's kind of the unspoken rule that any, unqual uh, any qualified NSU applicants that we can get into the interview uh, pool that we do get in. Um, which campus does the MD program utilize? Is it just the Davy campus or Tampa? And will it end up in Tampa at some point? Um, just the Davy campus. Um, I heard no talk uh, of us being in the Tampa location. As I said, uh, um, you know, I don't want to totally eliminate the possibility one day that we may um, expand uh, as a program and how that impacts resources. You know, obviously you want to make sure you have enough resources for us and every other program in HPD. Um, but as it stands right now, there's no plans to expand, so we'll probably be just at the Davy campus for a while. Uh, when is the deadline to submit the application, and will this be for the entering class in fall of 2021? Mm -hmm. Honestly, uh, I don't know, um, and I have to be honest about that in the sense of I, we we're planning, usually it's October, uh, the last day of October and the last day of November. Um, the last day of October for the, the AMCAS application the end of November for the secondary application, which is our application. <clears throat> I say I don't know because right now we honestly, we're, we're, it's still shifting sand that we're standing on here in terms of when we'll be back and when we'll start and all of these things that are going on. Um, so before, what I can say is that we will almost absolutely extend our deadlines. Um, and that's because we know some people are taking the MCAT later um, in, in the process. So we'll, 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 extend our deadlines and we may go a little bit longer in the interview process. Uh, I, I know Jamie hates to hear that right now, but we'll probably go a little <laughs> bit uh, longer in our interview process. Yeah, there's a surprise for you, Jamie, um, than we uh, normally do, but we'll, we'll probably make some type of adjustments based on um, everything that's happened. Um, next question from Jake. Um, do we have any plans for international students, Canadian specifically? Again, probably uh, pinpointing towards uh, full accreditation. Um, it's not that we don't like uh, international students. It's just that, again, 
um, there's different layers to our accreditation process and um, is kind of keeping it at as, as simple as possible right now in terms of our application process uh, just really helps us to accelerate through the uh, accreditation cycle. Um, but again, I think once we're in that full accreditation status, we'll expand our applicant pool, um, expand our programming, uh, as I said, joint and combined degree, and maybe even early assurance programs. Um, so there's a lot on the horizon, but I think we're just trying to, as they say, keep it simple, silly, uh, uh, um, until we uh, get to full accreditation. So probably uh, 2022 and beyond, we'll begin uh, accepting international applicants. Um, so that may have just answered uh, Fizza's question as well. When, we, when would we receive full accreditation? Mm -hmm. um, we have to wait until our charter class graduates, which will right. be 2022. Yes. Um, we do have another question from Ariana. I'm hoping that I'm pronouncing that right. If I'm not, I apologize. Um, when looking at the medical school applications, what makes a student stand out besides the basic requirements? Um, I, I think the, the best thing is just being, um, uh, and it sounds simple, but it, it's not really, um, it's just being kind of solid in each part of the application. I, I think um, it, it, it sounds like it would, the, the logical thing to kind of say, but a lot of applicants, um, I, I believe the biggest weakness of a lot of applicants is um, that they're not really self-reflective in this process. Like they, 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 they're kind of cognizant of weaknesses, but they don't really think about how those weaknesses will impact their application. Like they go, oh yeah, I know I kind of have a uneven academic record and maybe my MCAT's okay, but I'm just gonna go ahead and throw my hat in. Well, you're applying against 3000 other people for 50 seats in our program. And we're kind of low on that in the applications. Um, I, I mean, I think our applicant pool is comparable to our size. Uh, but at Albany Med, for instance, we had 7,000 applications for 100 seats. So it's something that you may think when you're competing against a pool of that size, and we only interview about 320 applicants per year for those 50, site, 50 seats. So I mean, um, that, that is a small portion of that overall pool. So the things that you th think that you kind of recognize are weaknesses and that you need to improve, it's in your best interest to take the time to improve those things um, before you go into the applicant pool. So if you need to improve your, your grades, your academic record, then maybe you should be looking at a post back or master's program of some type to improve that area. If you know you need to improve your clinical experiences, then you need to take a year or two gap year and do those things. But thinking that they won't stand out in the applicant pool, they absolutely will. Um, they, they'll, they'll stand out like a sunburst on your application. So I think the best way to kind of stand out is to be balanced across the board. Um, you know, I ask often, and Jamie knows this, she's heard it a hundred times, I usually ask what's the most important part of the application and people start throwing out different components. And I always say it's everything. Everything is important. And if you know that you need to improve one of those areas, it's better to take the time to improve that. Um, another probably biggest weakness, yes, kind of what stands out, what things that stands out in terms of mistakes that applicants make is are that they get on set on timelines. Like I'm gonna graduate, I'm gonna go to medical school and you know, then I'm gonna go on my residency, then I'm gonna do you know, um, a research or a residency and then I'm gonna do this and they have it all planned out and then I'm gonna get, you know, get married, had two and a half kids and, and, and the, the dog and the picket fence. And they get set on this timeline. So even if they believe there's a weakness, recognize that there's a weakness, like I probably need to go to graduate school and really do some graduate level work they go, no, 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 I can't take that year off <laughs> because I'm on the timeline, I have a plan. Well, if you know that you need to do that thing, most medical schools will probably recognize you need to do it too. And you're gonna spin your wheels um, for a year, not get accepted, and then your timeline is disrupted anyway because you cannot control this process. You could be a solid applicant and not get accepted into medical school. So you can't presume to know that you can control the timeline. So. I think the best thing to do is improve your application, each aspect of your application as much as possible. And that will shorten kind of the time you need to reach your goals. 
I know that was a long one. Talk about that, that too, because um, we each have different things with the application that stands out more to each person reviewing the application. I'm a sucker for the essays. I love those stories that like absolutely draw you in. And, you know, Dean Pritchett also has another uh, application story that he often tells when he's talking to undergrad students. And it's true, you know, so many of us have different things. People will look at the GPA or the breakdown of the MCAT, um, your secondary. So he, it's so important to make sure that you're good across the board, mm. as opposed to focusing on like one specific thing. Absolutely. Um, is there a preference between doing a double major or a graduate program, like a master's program when applying? Hmm. Um, no, I, I honestly, no, I don't think it's so much what you major in or, um, you know, I, I think, um, I always say major in what interests you because you'll do well. Um, but at the same time, um, you need to, uh, for us, in terms of medical school, the only thing we're really kind of looking for is that you hit the requirements, that you have a solid, solid upper division, um, you know, uh, uh, medical classes, that you do well, uh, obviously, on your our MCAT, particularly in the, the bio and phys sections and chem sections. Um, so, I, I mean, that's kind of what we're looking for. Now, what you choose to major in is up to you. I mean, this is kind of the time of your life to do it. Um, and in fact, we, we've had interesting cases with applicants that, you know, they apply and they, they have other interests um, um, that they, we, we want to see that you have other interests, in fact, um, and, you know, that they may want to pursue in life. So I don't think it's so much about whether you double major or anything like that. It's about your performance. It's always about your performance, not um, what you major in or if you double major or major in minor. Um, it's about your overall performance across the board. And if there is, you know, any inconsistency in the undergraduate level, then um, obviously what we really like to see is hopefully that happened early on. But if it happened late, there was a very specific reason in that you really um, relieve all doubts by cleaning that up in a graduate program. So a graduate degree only, it's not compulsory. It's only meaningful, really meaningful if you need it. Um, to, or if there was a specific reason you pursued it um, that ties to your medical training. So one doesn't really trump the other, a graduate over double major or minor or single minor. It's just really all about your performance. Um, the last one that we seem to have right now would be um, from George. Mm -hmm. I still need to take the MCAT. I'm hoping to schedule now in the next couple of months. Will that be a large disadvantage because I will most likely miss the early admission in June? Worried if it's at a first come first serve process. Mm, you know, if there's ever a time where, you know, I, I said a little while ago, I think earlier I said it's always better to apply early than later. Um, you know, and I think that's a general kind of rule to live by in this process. But if there's ever a time where that's probably kind of, been blown <laughs> uh, completely to smithereens is probably now. As I said, we would definitely adjust our, our uh, deadlines. Um, and I think in doing so, we adjust our deadlines um, with the mindset of, you know, there are people that are being pushed later into this process. Our pool probably won't look uh, like it normally does um, at certain times of the year. Uh, there's going to be different ebbs and flows. So I think if there was ever a time to, that gives applicants more flexibility or more leeway or more leniency, uh, as was said earlier, in terms of those hard press kind of deadlines or that that thought that you should apply early, this is probably that cycle. Uh, uh, so I, I think there's a lot more, um, it, there will be a lot more leverage in that regard. You know, although I say, you know, I don't think committees will view the, the MCAT through any different uh, prism, you know, and again, we're, I'm just kind of speaking to our committee. Um, what I can say is that every other aspect of this cycle and this process, I think will be looked at <laughs> uh, through a different prism because of everything that's going on. And, um, you know, that can, I, I can't really say what that evaluation will look like until we get into it, uh, unfortunately, um, because it's still an unknown 
Um, but, uh, you know, even now, I mean, um, we don't have a, a lot of students. We're, we're at the end of our application cycle. So the applicants we're seeing weren't really uh, impacted other than their interview, the late interviewers having to do it online. What they weren't really in, impacted by this process. So again, the the first candidates we'll really see as a committee that have really profoundly been impacted like by this process won't be until the fall. So um, until we get those candidates in a room to evaluate, it's gonna be very difficult to say specifically what emphasis will be placed on or what will be de-emphasized. I think that's all the questions we have in the chat. Um, I did post my email address as well as our admissions email address in the chat. Um, if you guys think of any other questions that we didn't touch on today, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Um, we're hoping that the cycle will probably begin shortly after July. Uh, I believe that uh, AMCAS is posting updates daily. So if you guys have already started that process, then you should be getting those as well. Um, yeah, if you guys think of anything else, please feel free to reach out and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Well, I mean, I know I have a few minutes. So, um, you know, I kind of rushed over some of the application things because, uh, you know, I figured, um, you know, I wanted to get kind of to the questions. Uh, but just kind of speaking specifically, as you guys go into the application process, um, you know, I would probably say, I just saw that question uh, pop up. Uh, no, we're completely separate from the osteopathic program. Um, our application processes are completely different, so one doesn't really impact the other at all. Um, I mean, students do apply to both, uh, but for me, that's more about the student understanding that there are two philo different philosophical tracks and, and modes of training. So I think it's very important as an applicant, you understand that um, and, and be kind of prepared to embrace that and understand that. But no, nah, it doesn't, one doesn't impact the other. Um, is that a research experience? Uh, sorry, Jamie, they're popping up in front of my face. Um, I think it's important to have, as I mentioned earlier, to have an understanding of research methodology. Um, you should kind of be able to, um, you know, I believe, build out, understand the, the research design, the research model. There's so many different types of research. A lot of people think that if you don't have bench research per se, you won't um, be considered. And that's not true. I mean, there's, uh, we have students that are working on sur evaluating surveys now, um, as it relates, oddly enough, to our admissions process and kind of uh, bridging that to certain outcomes, you know, within the curriculum. Um, so there's different types of uh, research that can be done. So I think you should have some type of experience in that at some level to understand the methodology so you're not starting from scratch when you come in and you have to plan a research project. Um, now, that said, we have a research, a, a P, when you come in, you'll have a research mentor. Every student uh, generally goes uh, has a research mentor, and everyone has to meet with Dr. Bachman, who is our oversees our first block um, in medical school, and he will work with you. If you have a research interest, with he will work with you directly to try and figure out what that is. So there's a lot of um, um, uh, kind of input and help that goes into that when you matriculate over, but it definitely helps to have an understanding of that methodology before you matriculate. I missed a couple questions after that. <laughs> um, well, the next question, I think I may have answered it for them. It was in regards to international um, students. They were asking, are there any particulars that you look for in a competitive international student? Um, I explained 2022 full accreditation. Yeah. And uh, I can probably answer that anyway. Uh, and beforehand, I, I don't think uh, it, the same thing we look for in any student. Um, I think it's about finding students that are a good fit for our program, uh, irrespective of where you are uh, geographically, in terms of your your ethnic background, your you know religious background, whatever the case may be. We're just looking for students that will be a good for our, fit for our model, for our PBL and TBL models, and we. And I guess what I was about to get into, since I had a little time, were the, the components of the application and, and kind of maybe 
as, as Jamie kind of alluded to, we each committee member has their thing they fixate on. Um, and that is great because it really lends to the holistic process. So many, all, all aspects are kind of covered in terms of the evaluation of each section of your application. And it all kind of comes together to create this, this idea of what we think this candidate is and how they fit into our paradigm at NSU MD. Um, but, you know, we are looking for students that have, uh, that seem to, that have demonstrated, you know, through their, um, their experiences, their commitment uh, to medicine. You know, pretty much every student applicant, all 3,000 of our applicants are passionate <laughs> and have drive and have grit and have all of those buzzwords that they will put in their application. But saying it and demonstrating it are two different things. We want to see the volunteer experiences, the um, clinical exposure. Um, we want to see the non-clinical exposure. We want to see that you have good balance in your life, that you have interests. So we're looking for a good, a wide range of things when it comes to your experiences, both non-clinically and clinically related. If you haven't been exposed to the field, it's hard to really convince a committee that you are passionate or that you are committed to this. So that's why the experiences are so important. In terms of letters of recommendation, you know, obviously one should come from one, at least one, I say at least, it's probably better to have more than one, but at least one should come from someone that has taught you or that taught you in a, a um, science-based course. And then after that, it can be wide ranging, but you know, it's good to have some letters that come from people that have taught you or, or uh, mentored you or was your preceptor in a clinical experience, obviously. Um, we want to, to hear that. We want to hear how other people evaluate, and evaluate you in the lens that they see you through, particularly in a clinical setting. I mean, that is basically your third and fourth year experience in medical school. You're being evaluated by clinicians. Um, so again, a lot of what happens at this level of the application process of that training process happens later in medical school. You know, people go, well, why place emphasis on MCAT? Well, because one of the biggest, most important and standardized tests you'll ever take is USMLE. And there is, uh, studies have shown a correlation between performance on the MCAT and USMLE. So we at least want to see some ability to be proficient in an area. Uh, same with academic record. There's uh, your academic record. Um, and why we assess that, scrutinize the classes you've taken. Um, we not only is there a correlation between what type of student you'll be when you come into medical school and your what type of student you were as an undergrad, um, but for our program, we also can look at someone and say, hmm, they haven't taken this course and they haven't taken this course. Um, maybe, you know, it, it helps us to guide our support when a student comes in. It doesn't mean we won't accept them, but we know if you haven't taken microbiology and immunology, well, that's that is huge in fundamentals. So you haven't been exposed to that. So that is something we can tell, tell our peer assistant learners, students, um, and our academic success specialists. We can say, hey, we have a lot of students that don't have this in our background. We can tell our, um, our course director, Dr. Bachman for fundamentals, um, you know, two thirds of the class hasn't taken immunology. And so maybe he can structure something in Lectorio, which we provide to our students to really allow students to beef up in that area, which will help them not just in their first block, but throughout medical school. So um, it, it's, that's why it's so important why we thoroughly assess your record, um, not just to weed out people, but to know how we need to adjust our curriculum for when students to come in to ensure that they're successful. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes students ask me, well, what courses should I have been taking? <laughs> no one has kind of asked that. Um, well, you know, obviously your core courses are important with lab. Um, but um, in one question I kind of anticipated, I thought was, I, I thought I was going to get is how are those students that were in core courses and then suddenly had to go online? How would that be viewed? You know, if you were halfway through Chem 2 and all of a sudden with your lab and all of a sudden the less, rest of the semester was um, done online, how will that be evaluated or any of the other core classes? And I say, you know, I guess I would say, I don't know, but um, I think um, that will be the challenge for admissions committees throughout the country. How do we, how do we view that performance? Um, and um, I think 
the answer is really what you do after that, what you do in your upper division courses. And some of the upper <laughs> division courses you should probably be taking are immunology. A lot of, you'll, you'll focus a lot of, on disease, um, particularly in your first, and this is just true at our school, at a lot of schools. Uh, we did the same thing at AMC. There was a, a huge focus on disease um, in our first year curriculum. And if you have immunology and virology um, and microbiology um, as upper division courses, it's really, really going to help you um, um, kind of moving forward. And of course, anatomy, any course that you can kind of take that's systems-based, physiology. Um, these are all types of courses you should probably be taking. Um, so, you know, definitely take those because that, those things are scrutinized. How prepared are you to come into our curriculum? And the more uh, solid array of upper division courses you have, the better you'll be in that regard. Um, um, I mentioned the letters of recommendation. Again, those, you don't get a lot of opportunities to talk about yourself to a committee. So um, having those assessments um, speaks volumes to an admissions committee. So you should be very selective uh, of, about those letters because they oftentimes give, if, if, don't just get someone because you sat in their class and you got a good grade, get someone that can speak to you as a person that got to know you, a preceptor, um, someone that you were a TA for, someone that you shadowed with, someone that can s reveal something to the committee that maybe we can't see elsewhere in your application. Um, just because you got a good grade, they can tell us you got a good grade, we can see that on your transcript. So we want letters that kind of tell something beyond what we can find somewhere else in the application. So you have to be really thoughtful about who you, you pick. Don't just pick names or pick grades, so to speak. Pick someone that can speak knowledgeably about who you are. Um, and that's particularly, uh, um, especially, I'm sorry, uh, true for us, because as I said, we have a lot of hands-on training. Our students do practice of medicine. They are interacting with patients almost from day one and they're training to interact with patients almost from day one. So we want to know who you are as a person. We can't, we can train you on a lot of things um, in our program. We can't train you on empathy. I can't, I can't teach someone to be empathetic. Okay, you either are or you aren't um, at, at this point in your life. So at the point that we're bringing you in the program, you have to have some characteristics that we can't train and we have to identify those things through your application. Um, so again, I, it's hard, your personal statement, you know, as Jamie said, she, she fixates on that. She's sometimes putting candidates on our crazy. radar. <laughs> she knows, she'll, she'll look through that secondary and, you know, at once they're screened and say, hey, can we bring this candidate in, you know, read their personal statement, you know, read this, read that, and she'll bring my attention to it. Um, and there's other committee members like that as well, that, will, that it's all about what is the candidate telling us about themselves? So you need to put a lot of time and thought. A lot of people think that they're not read. Well, that's how we screen a lot of applicants out. Mm. Secondary, the questions on the secondary application. So every part of the application is important. You should put a lot of time and thought into it. Um, I just want to get to the last um, couple questions really quick because it's a quarter to one. But um, one of the questions that somebody asked, George, I believe, was asking about age. Um, I was explaining over the chat our charter class, when our students started, um, the age range was from 19 to 36. So age doesn't really play a part in it. We just always say if you are, you know, a little bit older, if you've been out of school for a little while, um, if you have concerns about it, we really just look to make sure that you've had some meaningful experience over the time. Like we just don't want, you know, it, it's hard to review an applicant if it seems like they've just been kind of sitting at home deciding on what career path to go through for a couple of years and haven't really been doing anything. That's one of the things that we really look into over the secondary application where we want you to explain to us what you've been doing over, you know, your gap years or the time that you haven't been in school. So age does not play a part in it at all. Um, yeah, we actually had a few students that were 19 when they started, so, and um, a little bit, you know, early 30s and on. Um, and then the other question, too, was, do you recommend taking anatomy? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd say take all of the systems-based um, and, uh, or 
or disease-based uh, courses you can. Um, as I said, my, my personal recommendation, definitely if you can get immunology, uh, anatomy, physiology, microbiology. Um, and I feel like there's another one that I'm leaving out, but def well, biochem. <laughs> I, I, mm -hmm. I, I say that it should, most schools listed as optional or not required. I'm gonna tell you now, it's pretty much required. Biochem and immunology, and I'd probably say microbiology are three of the most important classes uh, that you, in terms of helping you transition to medical school right off the bat. So most schools list um, organic, I mean, um, biochem as optional. It really isn't, you should take it. It should be a part of your curriculum. And then, yeah, like I said, if you can work in physiology, anatomy, immunology, I feel like there's another one that I'm forgetting as well. Um, cellular, oh, molecular biology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, it, yeah, pretty much. You should have a good, a solid slate of upper division science courses. You really should. Mm -hmm. um, and balance, obviously, uh, because doing too much of that could impact your, if you don't manage that time wisely, could impact your overall performance. Um, but um, to kind of give you a sense of your first block of medical school, pretty much all of the sciences that I just listed, that's what you're, that's what you're going over in fundamentals. And everything. It's not exaggerating. Right. Yeah. Everything from your first year to your last year of college, every medical uh, science you've taken and the ones you haven't taken, they're in there too. So if you haven't taken immunology, it's in there. Um, and you're learning all of that at the medical, how to bridge that to medical, how to bridge that basic, those basic science concepts to medical knowledge. Okay, so it's fast, it's intense in the 16 weeks. Um, so the more of a base, more solid of a foundation you have in place, I, I say easier, quote unquote, easier that transition will be. I think that's all we have right now. Well, Jamie and Pritchett, thank you guys so much for taking the time today. I know uh, students that were on this chat and others that listen to our recording, they're going to get a lot of guidance and insight from you too on uh, the best way of approaching the application process and learning about your program. So thank you so much for taking the time. Well, it's a pleasure having, you know, hopefully we'll get to get back on campus and we'll get to get in front of you guys <laughs> physically. We love coming over and honestly, you know, um, I, I, I probably downplayed it a little bit, but Jamie knows if there's one place that we definitely want to have um, a kind of uh, uh, a, a bridge to um, and be accessible to, it is, you know, uh, NSU, our institution, um, and in the surround, and really the, any students from the surrounding area, but particularly there. So, you know, just we're happy to come over and talk and chat in small groups and large groups. We're right there. <laughs> so anytime you want us to come over or you want to come over to us and we'll set something up for you so you can kind of see us talk to our students a little bit and get to know us. We're always willing to just 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 reach out and we'll, we'll make it happen. I appreciate that. All right. Any student on the call that you want to re-listen to uh, today's webinar, it's going to be on our YouTube page for NSU Career. Um, and thank you again to Dean Pritchett and Jamie for taking the time out of their day and sharing your insights with our students. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. And stay safe, everybody. Bye. Bye.